Of course, uh, we will be uh, civil uh, in our discussion, and uh, Senator Newman, um, uh, though I, uh, I think this bill is quite lacking and had uh, uh, a, quite a few amendments actually drafted just to illustrate where I think uh, and where we think the deficiencies are, um, we're not going to offer all of those amendments because I think, um, uh, it, as, as you've said, uh, you've crafted a deal, a, a deal has been crafted. Uh, however, I do want to state for the record that um, that was a deal that was crafted uh, out of the view of the public, out of the view of myself, out of the view of largely of uh, members of, the, of the, the caucus that I'm a part of. Um, it was not subject to uh, conference committee process or hearings or input uh, and the like. And um, I don't think that that is uh, a good way to develop policy. I know there are arguments that, oh, well, we had you know, something similar uh, in the regular session. Um, but uh, Senator Newman and members and Madam President, uh, the fact is, is that here we are with the final bill. And uh, I know it's been posted for a few days, um, but you know the word goes down from on high, this is the bill, and it can have no amendments. Um, and I'm sorry, uh, members, but this is a representative democracy. Uh, we, each, we each represent uh, in excess of 80,000, plus we carry in our hearts uh, a passion for the good of the entire state and, and good, uh, a passion for uh, sound public policy. And um, barring input and barring listening to the ideas of people who maybe aren't uh, in agreement with you, um, some, uh, some, some of the ideas that find their way into what is going to ultimately become law um, may well not be the best. To that point, uh, Senator Newman, um, I want to respond to this uh, argument, this framing on the use of the general fund. Uh, somehow uh, Minnesota is deficient or out of step or out of league with other states who use general fund for their transportation purposes. Well, that is true. Uh, a number of other states use general fund uh, for transportation purposes. Uh, to say that, to argue that Minnesota doesn't is, is not true. And in fact, when we constitutionally dedicated the motor vehicle sales tax in uh, 2006, um, that was a tremendous and permanent diversion of what was previously uh, general fund money to uh, transportation purposes. So Minnesota has, has done that uh, on a permanent basis. And it's quite a bit of money, and we know it's one of the three uh, major tiers, uh, you know, or one of four if you count federal money that comes into the Trunk Highway Fund. Uh, the big three that support the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund being motor vehicle sales tax, license tab fees, and the gas tax. Uh, a large argument is made that somehow the uh, sources of uh, money that go into transportation are, quote, user fees uh, because they have their origin in transportation purposes and the like. That discussion usually centers around uh, the gas tax. Members, the gas tax really pays for less than 20 percent of the total amount of funding that Minnesota puts into all roads, and by far the largest amount of resource we put into funding our roads in this state, uh, well over half, is property tax that we all pay. Whether we own property or we rent, uh, we, are, we are all paying uh, property taxes. And members, uh, I, for the life of me, can't understand why uh, we don't talk about uh, the, the gas tax or license tab fees and some of, the, some of these other dedicated sources as, uh, as, a, as a means of relieving property taxes because the, the little bit that we are putting in in this bill, Senator Newman, um, is still going to leave a tremendous amount of pressure because we get almost nothing uh, to local jurisdictions uh, who report having in excess, both cities and counties each, in excess of a $400 million gap just to keep up with what we need uh, and to be economically competitive in the deterioration of their roadway system, which represents over 90 percent of all the roadway miles we have in our state. So if we're able to actually do a bill that's sustainable uh, and that's sufficient, get dollars uh, to our local jurisdictions to take care of the roadway network that they have to take care of, 
um, that would take a tremendous amount of pressure off our property taxes, a regressive form of taxation, very uh, poorly related to people's ability to pay. In relationship to other states, the general fund represents only 3.9% of funding that other states use for roads. Uh, and in fact, uh, the average amount, uh, the midpoint is about $75.3 million per year. So um, coming into uh, the general fund to the tune of 300 and some, or $300 million per year would put us as an outlier uh, in the top 10, probably in the top uh, five or six of states that use general fund uh, for this purpose. I was talking about this trend of using the general fund uh, in recent years uh, for transportation purposes. Uh, Senator Newman, the greater trend, there are a few states that have added uh, some general fund appropriations to transportation. The greater trend by far is the permanent, dedicated, reliable, sustained source of the gas tax. Most other states look to the gas tax the way we do as a constitutionally dedicated source. And in 2005, starting in 2005 up to 2014, 17 states raised their gas taxes. Nine did so uh, in 2015. And I'll just add, the vast majority of those were controlled uh, by the other party. The party not, the party opposite, as a colleague of mine used to say. Five so far have done so in 2017. Um, I don't know what is so dramatically and vastly different than, than our state is uh, when talking about um, this particular source. Um, Senator Newman, uh, when our state has dedicated general fund to transportation purposes by appropriation, relying on future legislatures uh, to continue uh, to, to do so, uh, and when I talk about the fact that that's not reliable, that's not sustainable, I'm not just saying so because it's a possibility for those dollars to be reversed in a subsequent session. I'm saying so because every single time this state has done that, they've reversed themselves. They've committed to a long-term devotion of general fund dollars, and within a year, sometimes two years, they've backed that out and reversed that commitment. So, Senator Newman, this entire uh, package of budget bills that we're creating uh, for the state of Minnesota um, is destined to become a permanent uh, structural deficit package that we're putting together with these tax breaks and the tax bills that are going to balloon and start to consume all of our available resources, the kind of hits that we're uh, taking uh, in, the, in the Health and Human Services bill, um, also going to exacerbate we're not dealing with our future liabilities. This, uh, with the $110 million we're leaving behind uh, for transit purposes, which I'll get to in a moment, uh, we are going to have, we're very predictably, a tremendous amount of pressure on our general fund for competing resources. Mark my words, these general fund dollars that we're appropriating today, this $300 million that's going to balloon to $400 and some million dollars in the next biennium for road purposes, it's going to go away. And we're going to have the same problem in our hands we are solving no problem for the long term uh, in this bill. In 2001, a $311.5 million general fund transfer um, was reversed that had been de dedicated in 2000 uh, by about half. And then in 2003, a different general fund transfer to the Trunk Highway Fund had, that had also been done in 2000 uh, was reduced by over half. The motor vehicle sales tax, before we got to the constitutional uh, dedication. In 1981, a law was passed to statutorily dedicate the motor vehicle sales tax 100% to transportation purposes. And that was to be phased in over the course of four biennia. In the next year, because of budget pressures, that phase in was delayed for two years. Then it began in 1985, so fully three years later. And then the next two years, it was cut to zero. And then the next couple of years, we got to 30-some percent. And then in 1991, it was cut back to 25 percent. And then in 1992, that law was repealed entirely. And nothing came in from that general fund source for about 10 years. Uh, and then 
uh, then it started to uh, creep in again with varying dedications and reversals on those dedications until the people spoke up uh, in the form of a constitutional amendment and committed those resources 100 percent. It's interesting that uh, the uh, stated opposition uh, to raising the gas tax, even modestly, um, is made on the argument of, of whether or not uh, that particular source is progressive. Senator Newman and members, you'll be interested to know that the, uh, the 110, the $70 million one time that's given to transit uh, in this biennium, uh, with nothing coming to transit to address its needs or its deficit in the subsequent biennium, which is going to serve up a $110 million deficit, uh, is going to force fare increases. And what is more regressive, less progressive than forcing those who can least afford it, the elderly, the poor, our students, uh, to pay more. And it would come to more, much more on an annual basis uh, per person uh, to pay those increased fares, so much so that it's going to cause a huge drop off in the use of transit because people simply aren't going to be able to afford to pay that hit to their monthly budget. And there's argument that Oh, you know, it's been a while since the transit fares have been increased, et cetera, et cetera. Well, let me uh, also recite a little history on, on our, our fare increases. Since 1988, we've increased transit fares 10 times. Does anyone know how many times we've increased the gas tax since 1988? One time, 2008, in an amount that we knew was going to be insufficient to get the job done. Hence, every year since then, uh, we hear from the Department of Transportation the fact that half of our roadway system has aged beyond its useful life 26. and that their needs are getting more and more expensive just to maintain what we've got, much less add to the capacity of a growing economy and a growing population that's gonna, that places ever more pressure and demands on our roads. One time, if the gas tax had matched Inflation, it's now at 28.5 cents, we know that. If it had been allowed just to grow with inflation and had the same buying power then as it does, as it would today, it would be 40.1 cents. If it was allowed to grow at the same rate that we've asked of transit riders, it would be at 58.3 cents. If someone is a regular worker who uses their transit during the rush hour when we charge a peak fare, our gas tax, if we were being fair to folks who use different modes, it would be the uh, equivalent of 70.6 cents per gallon. So it is really hard to swallow all of the scorn that's heaped upon uh, transit riders uh, and not paying uh, their fair share when, in fact, uh, they've borne the brunt of the deficiencies that we've delivered uh, to the transitway budgets year in and year out, and we've done nothing of the like uh, for in, in the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund or the, or the sources that we dedicate to local roads for the pressure that they receive. Transit, uh, just uh, against the CPI over the past 10 years, has outstripped it by more than two times. But members, um, that's all just a, a conversation about uh, the facts, the history, the numbers, the, t the statistics. This is really all about people and their lives and their ability to get to the things that they need to get to. Uh, there's a young person by the name of Raven who works as an intern in Senator Hayden's office who uses transit every day. Raven says, I use transit every day from Fridley to downtown St. Paul because I go to school at Fair High School, to MCTC in downtown Minneapolis, uh, where Raven does PSEO, post-secondary educational opportunities, and to the state capitol because I have an intern with State Senator Jeff Hayden. That's how I get back and forth. That's how I got that opportunity because I know how to get myself around the city. I'm only 17. So I'm the youngest one they had ever entered there. And they were concerned how to get back and forth because I can't drive. 
I like being in the city. I like the hustle and bustle of everything. I like seeing people. I like seeing culture. And the transportation system lets me do that. If the fare is too high, I can't get around because my parents can't afford that. And I can't. And they won't let me work because they want me to focus on my education. I need this stuff so I can be famous and rich when I get older. The words of a 17-year-old. Leslie, I'm getting some assistance from the state of Minnesota. They paid for me to get vocational rehabilitation, and they are funding vocational training for me to go through Goodwill Easter Seals. The only way that I get to these meetings and to job interviews is through Metro Transit. Being able to have access to the bus and light rail is how I get to these really important appointments which are helping me get employed again. I need to be able to get there 30 minutes early to meet their strict attendance policy. One missed class and they kick you out. But the transportation system worked perfectly to get me there on time. Leslie Ann spends so much time on the bus commuting between Minneapolis and the suburbs, she had to leave a well-paying job. When you miss the bus, you have to wait for an hour. It affects how you live, how you eat, how you shop, how you sleep. You don't get to rest when you get home at 9 p.m. and have to wake up at 5 a.m. You don't have time to do anything else but get up and go to work. Ombre is a contractor who drives to jobs in the southwest suburbs and bikes and takes public transit for other trips. If there are fare hikes, she says she is fortunate enough now that it will have little to no effect on her transit use, but this was not always the case. She was transit dependent for two years because her car broke down and couldn't afford the repairs. Two part-time teaching jobs, barely making ends meet, taking seven buses each way. Thomas and his wife live in the metro, but both have many older relatives and friends throughout greater Minnesota who can no longer drive safely. They have become isolated and immobile. Jeremy is a freelance website developer who moved here from Michigan. Transit options have given him the freedom he's needed to be independent and successful. The Green Line light rail has made it possible for him to expand his business. Tom is a Metro Mobility rider. He waits two hours to get a ride to church on the weekends and is often still late for service. He knows firsthand that Metro Mobility can't keep up with the riders they currently have. Senator Newman and members, these people aren't abstract people. These are people starting businesses. These are people who are aspiring to greater things in their lives. They are inspiring examples to me. They are overcoming disabilities. They're trying to take care of their senior relatives and parents. They're, they're trying to accomplish things with their lives. They're trying to get to school. If we serve up the kind of cuts that are proposed in this bill, these people will be isolated and abandoned. That is unconscionable. That is immoral. I won't argue that we've done so much for roads on the other side of the equation. It's 200 and some million dollars. It's not the 300 million, by the way, because a, a certain amount of that was, was shaved off one-time money for transit, but a, a bunch of other little things proving within the bill itself the unreliability of this general fund source because when things need to be reconciled because of pressures, competing pressures inside the bill, where do we go? This source of money, because this is the general fund dollars that are flexible. But I will say that the level of disparity and the level of unfairness as comparing the road funding to the transit funding is shocking. It shocks the conscience. And I, it, it, I, I can't believe it can, it can be even defended. We are talking about serving up a deficit in the transit system of over a third. You heard about that one hour wait? That bus might not even come to serve that person, or it might be two hour waits. How many of you in this chamber have stood on a corner waiting for a bus late at night or in bad weather, running late to a meeting, or knowing that that bus had better pick you up at the stroke of the scheduled time because you are barely going to make it. The level of stress that that induces is hard to describe. How many of you have had to shuttle little kids around and groceries and, and do all of your errands and get to appointments and take care of your lives? How many of you have 
had to go from the job to school to pick up kids to run your errands and get back home using transit. It's already difficult. It's already inadequate in this region. To make it that much worse means we are heaping abuse and indignity on real people's lives, our friends, our neighbors, people we care about. I can't even believe we are contemplating passing this bill. It defies my imagination. It breaks my heart.